I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners and custodians of this land. To their elders, past, present and emerging, I pay my respects. I'm Rebecca Giblin, an assistant lecturer at the Monash Law Faculty. I work at the intersection of law and culture, and right now my research is focused exclusively on issues around books and libraries and authors. I'm so excited to be here at the Wheeler Centre for this special event presented in conjunction with the law faculty as part of my author's interest project. Now, when we look at author income, particularly for full-time professional writers, we're seeing some really concerning trends. We're seeing a field of highly educated, professional writers writing books for far below the minimum wage. In Australia, we see that even the top 25% of literary fiction writers are reporting average incomes of about $9,000 a year. The overall median from writing work, about $2,800. And over in the UK, the, the trend is even starker. There are real falls that we're seeing there. In just eight years, the number of full-time professional writers able to make a living from their writing work has fallen from 40% to 11.5%. Now, copyrights are broader and longer than they've ever been, but incomes are falling. So we're here tonight to ask, how do writers get paid? You might have noticed that authors are always situated at the center of copyright debates. But what's easily missed is that copyright law is actually structured around protecting owners. And while the interests of owners and authors do have quite a lot of alignment, social and economic and technological developments are causing them to increasingly diverge. So what we're going to talk about tonight is authors' interests, how they're being challenged, in current markets, and how we might rethink the ways that we do things in order to not only help get them paid, but also to help get their books read. I'm joined by three panellists, Corey Doctorow, one of my favourite writers and thinkers, currently here on tour in Australia with his new book, Walk Away. Zoe Rodriguez, a lawyer for 15 years at the Copyright Agency and now at the Arts Law Centre and Alex Adset, a writer's agent who represents a terrific list of Australian talent. We're going to be spending about 45 minutes doing free-ranging conversation and then 15 minutes for questions. And I'm going to borrow Corey's method for the questions. We'll start with a question from a woman or someone who identifies as non-binary and then go to a man or someone who identifies as non-binary and then we'll alternate from there. So think about whether you want to have a question. So we've got so many interesting things to talk about tonight. I want to just jump right in. Corey, you've described art as an irrational market. What do you mean by that? And can that help explain what's happening to authors' incomes? Well, I think it's the case that historically the fraction of people who set out to make a living in the arts uh, as uh, who actually made a living in the arts, even a very modest living in the arts, was infinitesimal. Right, you know, the ratio of people who ever took a guitar lesson to the ratio of people who ever made money playing the guitar, it's, it's not a, it's, it's effectively zero, right? Or, you know, you divide it out to zero. And what that means, you know, we make art for, for reasons that are intrinsic and that are really um, significant to us. There's the old cliche goes that the reason I write is because I can't stop. And what that means is that there's enormous potential for uh, exploitation partly because there's a lot more competition than you would expect in a kind of rational market. There are way more writers who are willing to sell their books for very small amounts of money than, than uh, the rational actor theory would predict. And so if you walk away from the deal offered by a publisher, there's very likely someone else standing behind you willing to take that deal. Uh, and uh, and on, so that means that there's a lot of opportunity for exploitation. It also means that market forces on their own tend not to produce uh, higher incomes for writers. Rather, what produces higher incomes for writers is leverage, and that can come in a lot of different forms. Um, it can come in the form of the uh, ability to negotiate on the basis of having already done something significant. So writers sometimes get a two-book deal for a very modest sum of money, but if, that, if those two books perform very well, get a third book deal for a much larger sum of money. Um, sometimes we get leverage through statutory instruments that just require or oblige publishers to pay us in certain ways, um, sometimes through collecting societies. Um, and sometimes we get leverage by increasing the number of publishers, right? That one of the remedies for having an oversupply of sellers 
is to have a larger supply of buyers. And unfortunately, what we've seen in the last 40 years in every single sector, energy, transportation, logistics, construction, publishing, music, movies, and so on, is consolidation. And the dismantling of uh, the traditional uh, antitrust and monopoly enforcement uh, in favor of a new model propagated by the Chicago School that says that the only time you need to worry about monopolies is when they're fixing prices. And in every other circumstance, no matter what they're doing, their supply chains, no matter how vertical or horizontal they are, it's okay to let them get as big as they want. And that's produced a world with five publishers and four music labels and five movie studios. And that has been not great for artists except for the few that become extremely successful because they get such excellent returns to scale that they're able to uh, uh, sell our work for an enormous amount of money. Mm. And so, Alex, you're dealing with these issues at the coalface. So you've got to negotiate on behalf of these authors who are well aware of these realities. Um, and certainly, I often see when I'm looking, uh, for example, if I'm looking at blog, writers' blogs, and uh, I see these comments um, on blogs about the, the terrible trends in writers' incomes, you often read something that says, oh, yeah, but we don't do it for the money. And I'm just like, don't tell them that. But, but you have got to, you've got to do the negotiating in these circumstances. So obviously it's a shifting landscape, but what can you tell us about the, the current trends and the current battlegrounds for you? Oh, well, it's getting tougher is the one thing. And it's, you're so lucky almost to get a deal offered at all. And you, if you get an advance on top of that, it's, you know, even more of a bonus. Um, and you pick your battles. Uh, so if you're in a great situation where you get a bidding war between publishers, that's, those are the situations where the author actually has the power to dictate some of the terms. But if you've only got one offer on the table, you really have to look at inventive ways to make that deal more palatable. Um, so if a publisher isn't able or willing to offer a decent advance, you then look at the royalty structure. So standard royalties of 10% of, of recommended retail price in Australia. And then you talk to the publisher about can we get a rising royalty? You know, the idea being if the book is actually successful, that author's going to get remunerated no matter what. So it shouldn't matter so much, technically, how big or little the advance is, as long as there's a decent royalty structure. Um, some <coughs> publishers are more willing to look at that, look at rewarding the author if the book starts doing really well. Some aren't. And sadly, we are looking at a situation where the, the publishers are merging. Um, we're getting the big, the big ginormous big six have turned into the big five. How much bigger are they going to get? And um, because they've got bottom lines and head offices and, and bosses in other countries, the publishers are getting squeezed almost as much as the authors. So it's getting harder to get a decent deal. Mm. But you asked about um, one of the current battles we're facing is audiobooks. Audiobooks used to be something that was fairly easy for me as an agent to hang on to for the author, and then we'd try to negotiate a deal separately. Um, audiobooks are becoming a deal breaker for publishers um, in the same way that ebooks used <coughs> to be take it or leave it and is now a deal breaker. You cannot do a deal with a big publisher without ebooks being associated. Now it's becoming audiobooks. And so they'll just walk away if you say, you know, we, we yep. hold the line on that? Absolutely. And I've just had a battle with that. We had an established author who's been signing books with uh, a mainstream publisher for ages. Audiobooks has just become the battle line and the publisher was willing to walk away. Mm. Mm. And Corey, we were talking about this this morning as well, about how difficult it is to get a change to a standard form contract these days. It's, I think it's one of the uh, inefficiencies of scale. So it may be that this publisher would be well served to create a variance in their contracts, but because the publishers have become so big, and because they're merged uh, multiple divisions, many of whom overlap with one another, they've acquired different imprints that overlap, there's a lot of you know, princelings and dukes uh, fighting over who is going to be ascendant in some little domain. And one of the things we saw with ebooks was that this played out often to the detriment of the whole firm. Economists call it the principal agent problem, when the person spending the money is not the person who's, uh, is, they're spending someone else's money, so they spend it to their benefit, not to the benefit of the person who's bankrolling it. And what the publishers began to do was create uh, no exceptions, uh, invariant contract clauses like ebooks, like audiobooks. In the case of at least two of the big five, HarperCollins and, and uh, Achette, 
no variances on splitting territorial rights uh, in the Anglosphere. So his, most writers historically have uh, sold into the Commonwealth and then into the US as separate markets. Often if you're from the Commonwealth, you'll sell three Anglospheric deals, one in your home country like Canada, one in the rest of the Commonwealth, and then a third one in the US. Those have become deal breakers. And the thing is that um, there may be perfectly good circumstances to create those variances, but because m the majority of instances in which variances are proposed is to do some empire building for some puny martinet on one floor of the Flatiron building or the HarperCollins building or whatever, they say, well, those variances are created when someone way up the corporate ladder approves them. And if your a junior editor or even a senior editor acquiring a book for one division, it's just not worth your political capital to ask your boss's 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 boss in Berlin or Paris whether it's okay to create this variance. And they just say, all right, well, go find a different publisher. Mm -hmm. And Alex, you mentioned that those ter the territorial rights was a particular problem for authors as well in terms of selling the rights in multiple jurisdictions. It's a, it's a killer. Like, um Gosh, we, Australia fought the battle back in the 70s, that we were our own territory, and I guess Canada did the same thing, mm -hmm. that you know, we, we've got a huge book market here, we've got a huge book buying population, but over the last particularly 10 years, that's really been eroded as the UK are just not doing deals unless they get Australian rights as part of that. Which on the one hand, great, we've got a deal, any deal's a good deal, mm -hmm. um, but if you do a deal with a UK publisher and you're an Australian author, your books, more often than not, are sold back into Australia via a sister company. They're marketed as export, um, so, sorry, sold in as export, which means the author's getting 10% of net receipts, if that. So you're selling books, you're doing all your promotion here, you're a local author, and you're getting maybe 20 cents a book. And it's just disgraceful that the bigger companies mm. go, well, that's the price of doing business with us. And it strangles local publishers. Uh, in Canada, we certainly saw this, where, where our local publishers uh, had to compete not on price, right? But on, uh, they, they had to, they couldn't, making it a like for like bid with Penguin Canada or HarperCollins Canada or whatever was insufficient of itself to, uh, to attract the author because you had to be able to outbid the total re reasonable expectation of that author's return through the entire Commonwealth to get just the Canadian rights. We have a few Canadian publishers that did really well. Um, I think throughout the Anglosphere, the one thing that, that uh, is still being felt is the Harry Potter effect. Bloomsbury, Raincoast in Canada, where these, these publishers that were little boutiques that took a flutter on, on Joe Rowling became powerhouses that can in fact you know, punch above their weight, right? They, they do retain their authors even when those authors do a deal in the UK separately or, or, or the US separately. But, you know, again, when you have one publisher, even the publisher run by the nicest big-hearted slobs you can imagine who feel a patrician duty to the literary arts, you don't get as good a deal as if you had two of those publishers. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Alex as well, in the last year or two, authors' organizations have been really pushing for reform of publishers' interactions with authors. And one of their key complaints has been that agented authors are offered different terms at first instances than unrepresented authors. Has that been your experience here in Australia? It, it has. Um, and that's, I started my career at Simon & Schuster in London, Penguin in Melbourne here, um, before becoming an agent. And you do, you see that, that um, if, if you've been an agent for a few years, you negotiate different clauses with different publishers. Publishers now recognise the things that I always ask for. And, um, and so it saves time for them to send me a contract that I've negotiated previously, which means that the five to 15 niggles that I have with any particular publisher's contract mm. have been fixed. Mm. And that means they're still sending out their boilerplate yeah, to different so authors. But the things that I've negotiated might be different to another agent's negotiated. Um, and that varies over time as well. When I first started out as an agent, I didn't have that boilerplate with every publisher. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, eight years in, mm. I do, and my authors are getting better deals right from the outset. And so the unagented authors are just getting the initial thing that's got all of the problems, which really makes me think there's a, a standard form Hollywood contract that, you know, there's no budging on in which authors are required to sign over all of their rights in full, in perpetuity, not just throughout planet Earth, but throughout the universe at large. Yeah. <laughs> so if a lucrative extraterrestrial market does emerge, it's still not going to be the artists yeah. who get rich. Yeah. yeah. To be fair, I was working at a big publisher and we were offered that 
deal from a film producer in America as well. <laughs> That doesn't it, always help. And, and, you know, this is we're really a game of iteration, right? When you, when you, in game theory, when two players iterate with one another, they, they converge on a set of terms that's more beneficial to both of them instead of being stilted because they know what each one will give up. And in publishing, there's often this dual nature where the firm itself runs as like a, a shareholder capitalist firm that feels that it has a fiduciary duty to its investors to never give a dime to the writer that they could retain for the shareholders. But the individuals, they're friends with the writers. They want to kind of find a, a, a happy medium. And so, you know, Dell Magazines, which has been through about 11 owners since I started writing for them, they, they publish Asimov Science Fiction Magazine and Analog, the uh, oldest science fiction magazine in the world, eventually split their contract onto two pages. And all of the reasonable stuff was on page one. And all the crazy stuff like theme park rights and action figure rights was on page two. And it was designed that way so you could tear off the second page, sign the bottom of the first page, and send it back to them if you knew. Mm. And I think that's a really important point to distinguish we, we, I, I don't want to be um, coming across that we're publisher bashing here, but we're talking about these Sounds trends. Like but of course, there's, <laughs> there's terrific publishers out there doing a, a wonderful job. And so many of them are run by book-loving, passionate individuals. They keep the whole thing going, and often for like, quite low wages themselves. Mm. So, oh. so I think it's really essential to recognize that. When we're talking about these overall trends of consolidation, um, the large publishers, the, the lessening flexibility mm. around authors and negotiating, then... Yeah. Uh, Can I jump in? And I want to say one. Of course, there are the big five publishers and... I know a lot of authors, I've met them through my almost two decades of working as a lawyer with authors and publishers and visual artists and others. People go for that. In Australia we are lucky, we have a rich publishing industry with many very, very strong, interesting, interested, independent publishing houses. Uh, mm -hmm. There is not just five multinationals uh, working here. A second thing, I think an agent is a very good thing. Many authors have said to me, actually, it's even hard to find an agent. Uh, the market to get an agent interested in you is difficult. I will put my cap on now as somebody who is doing work with the Arts Law Centre of Australia uh, and as somebody who has for a very long time worked with the Australian Society of Authors as a partner in a number of projects. For authors who don't have an agent, don't want one, can't get one, um, or, and also don't seek to get legal advice from a private lawyer, which can be very expensive. The Arts Law Centre of Australia, in partnership with the Australian Society of Authors, provides a contract review service for authors. They are very aware of the items where there may be difference between what an author might want and what a publisher might have as a standard clause. They know what to look out for. It's a very affordable way of getting advice and for who, who are authors here? Who in the audience is an author? Oh, a few, that's good. Um, so I encourage you, I extol you, go and look at the Arts Law Centre of Australia, consider. I think if you, you can ask some questions without having to pay, you get one or two advices for free if they're simple enough. The contract review service, I, I think you pay $160 a year uh, to have access to legal advice over contracts. Um, so just yeah. putting in a plug for some other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I jump in? I have a a spiel that in Australia particularly, you don't need an agent. Having an agent is a choice, not a necessity. And I say that as an agent. Uh, it is pretty much a necessity in the US and the UK, but we're really lucky here that our publishers are lovely and are much more willing to talk to authors directly. So there are fantastic contract review services. So you can negotiate contracts even as an author. So when we talk about authors just getting the boilerplate from the get-go, that doesn't mean it's not negotiable. And, mm. and I'm, a, I'm a former Canadian Regional Director of the Science Fiction Writers of America, and we have similar services as to our members. We have model contracts that we publish. You'd be amazed at how many times I've negotiated with a magazine and said, uh, I'm just not going to sign that. And when they've said, why not? I said, because my, fresh, my professional organization advises me not to sign a clause in that form. 
And that settles an, a number of these arguments. It's, it's, I mean, it's a ridiculous, fallacious argument from authority, but it settles the question. We also do uh, random audits on behalf of our members um, every year uh, of their books and of the uh, accounting of the publishers. We often find irregularities that results in uh, payments to our authors. And we have a grievance committee that I've used personally. So if your uh, publisher violates your contract, this is, this is an underappreciated element of this, but no one wants to sue their publishers, right? Especially in a world where there are five majors, mm -hmm. suing one of them probably kills you with the other four. Uh, and so having a grievance committee that can go in and say, we will advise our members that your dealings are uh, not in accordance with the contracts that you offer and you can't be trusted to keep your word is an incredibly valuable service that professional organizations offer. Uh, and um, I'm no longer an officer of the Science Fiction Writers of America, but I'm still a dues-paying member. We have many Australian members, uh, and we have an Australian region. So if you are a genre writer, it's a great institution to join. Mm -hmm. And the Australian mm -hmm. Society of Authors as well has just updated its model contract. Oh, and it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that, that call yeah. to authority, I think, is, is yeah. a very useful strategy if you are negotiating. Yeah, oh, it's not me, actually, but this says, mm -hmm. yeah, that we should, uh, we should continue talking. Um, and, you know, about our local publishers, there's so many authors that I've been speaking to in the course of my research recently um, who are choosing to sign locally where they can uh, and then sell the rights internationally for a lot of works, but choosing to take a smaller advance, perhaps, um, to publish one of our, with one of our fantastic small or medium-sized publishers because there are so many advantages to doing that yeah. and working but with these firms. To harken back to what we were saying before, it reduces the number of international publishers you can try to sell your books to from, three to, from five to three because two of them will only acquire global rights and if you've done a local deal, you're dead. And so, you know, again, back to just straight up like Econ 101 negotiating theory, fewer buyers means a worse deal for sellers. And so I, I'm, I don't wanna say, well, let's, let's just not take any action until we've uh, righted the wrongs of late stage capitalism because everything else is tinkering in the margin. But I do think we should acknowledge that when our interventions are merely tinkering in the margin, that that's what they are, and that, that the deep structural problems of vertical and horizontal integration and lax antitrust and anti-monopoly uh, enforcement are the, are the real structural barriers. And I think that, you know, we, we often pose a question as between big tech and big content. If you look closely at those listed companies, they are owned by exactly the same private equity firms and large institutional investors. They, they are literally the same people who are electing those boards of directors for those firms, with the exception of Macmillan, which is family owned, but the, the, the rest of them, and, and, and HarperCollins, which although the, there's a bunch of publicly held shares, the voting shares are held by one family. Um, so, you know, there, there really isn't uh, much of a difference. It's the final scene of Animal Farm where you look from the farmers to the pigs and you can't tell the difference anymore. And honestly, while instrumentally there are times where, uh, where seeing big content getting a better deal might give authors a better deal, there are also times when big tech getting a better deal might get authors a better deal. Neither of them will give authors a better deal on their own if they don't have to, right? It's only when, when it's to their, it's only when our interests briefly align and we have to be really cognizant of the idea that just because we're on their side, it doesn't mean they're on our side. Mm. Yeah, so I think we have to be really careful not to just adopt a regulatory response. You know, obviously there's a lot of hostility towards big tech at the moment. They've captured a huge share of the global ad market. I think it's 25% now of the global advertising market that's on and offline. If you look at online only, it's about 60%. So there's a lot of hostility because they're not actually investing very much in the content that that's attached to. But if we choose a regulatory response that just shifts money from big tech to big content, that's not really gonna do anything to enrich artists, is it? Unless we also change the balance of power. No, I'd suggest a different model. Um, I worked for a long time at the Collecting Society in Australia for Writers and Publishers, Copyright Agency Limited. It was born out of a different technological disruption that some of you might remember, called photocopying. Um, and in those days, our publishers and authors were very worried about, particularly educators, using photocopiers to supplant buying textbooks. Um, our government, I think with great good sense, said, uh, because there were furious arguments then, very similar to what is happening now in the online environment. And our government said, our educators have to be able to use world-class technology. 
We want our students to have access to the very best content their teachers think they should have access to. And if that means that they're not going to buy one particular textbook and that's it for them for that subject uh, for that year, that's, that's how it has to be. On the other hand, we have authors and publishers that have to be paid. They've invested a lot of time, talent, skill creating works. And so they created a compromise, which was the statutory licence scheme that we have in Australia, that says, OK, that can happen, but we're going to run surveys of usage based on that copyright agency for Australia's creators. will go out, survey copying, and based on that, collect and then distribute money back to Australia's authors and publishers. For me, the on in online environment is fantastic. It is an enabler for people to access content like we never have before. But I think it needs a similar intervention in Australia at least that will say, all right, if whatever the platform, if this content is being used and valued by consumers, then we, we take some kind of money back and we give it back to the people whose works have been valued by the consumer market whatever that market is, whether it's educational, government, corporate, um, and we will remunerate rights owners based on that. But I don't, don't think that's revolutionary. I think that's probably fair. But don't we still have to do something to shift that balance of power? Because, so for example, the way um, the educational statutory licences are regulated in Australia is purely by contract. So the contract decides how much of that statutory licence money goes to publishers and how much goes to authors. And the Australian Society of Authors has expressed concern that there's so many contracts that give 0% no. of that collective society so money to authors. No, the Australian Society of Authors is concerned about one particular area of publishing, and I happened to run this program in a cow, and when it was a very fraught um, argument between publishers and authors, and it was one particular publisher in the educational sector that was taking what the ASA criticised as a land grab of Cal entitlements from its authors. Um, in the other areas, the different genres have different norms. Many of them are 50-50. 50% of copyright entitlements from Cal go to the author, 50 to the publisher. And then there are other genres, again, where the industry standard is 100% is retained by the author, uh, with zero for secondary use, downstream use, going to the publisher. Poetry is the number one example of that. So well, I, I, I beg your in pardon. Australia, yeah. I, I think that that, it, that that is a laudable model. It's great to hear that there are authors who are getting 100% of their statutories, and and you know, of all the different ways we can, you know, of all the imperfect ways that we can solve the problem of it being difficult to control individual use. Actuary is not the worst one. I mean, it works well in, in um, uh, collecting for a radio airplay. You know, imagine if every time a DJ at 3 Triple R wanted to drop the needle on a record, she had to, you know, ring up Elton John's manager and negotiate whether it was going to be 10 cents or 15 cents for that airplay. You know, obviously, you need to take the friction out of the system, and collectivizing payments makes a lot of sense. But particularly in the textbook market, uh, and in the educational market, it's kind of a dog's breakfast as a, as a matter of course and has been since the earliest days. So uh, I have a, a dear friend who's not with us anymore named Aaron Swartz, who was a sort of boy genius. He helped invent one of the core technologies in the web when he was 12. He was one of the founders of Reddit. Uh, and then he started doing these research projects where he would download big corpuses of uh, scholarly material. Uh, for example, he identified a pattern where monies given to law professors followed law review articles that defended um, oil interests, uh, lack of liability for health issues resulting from oil exploration. So he would do that with these big computational analyses. And when he was a fellow at Harvard, he walked down the street to MIT where he was allowed to be by their rules and he logged onto their Wi-Fi which he was allowed to connect to by their rules and he started downloading scholarly articles which he was allowed to do by their rules. Uh, he violated the term that said you have to download them by clicking on them. He wrote a little script to do it but other than that he, he was doing sort of the, the, the everything that he was allowed to do. As a consequence of that, he was facing 13 felony prosecutions and 35 years in prison when he hanged himself in 2013 at the age of 26. And when in the debate that ensued about it, there were a lot of people who said, well, this Aaron kid sounds very smart, but how are these authors going to get paid if some kid can walk into MIT and download the articles? And the thing that was sort of darkly hilarious about this 
is not one of those authors had ever been paid for any of that publishing. They had been required by the journals that they published in to assign all their copyright as a condition of being published. Now that's the majority of material that's used in tertiary and upper level secondary education, right? Our works in which the authors have never and will never be paid. It's why the open access movement has, has become such a powerhouse. In the world of, of uh, secondary education, I'm a textbook author and my work has been widely excerpted for textbooks. It's in a lot of Australian course packs. I'm not a member of an Australian collecting society. You could collect a million dollars. It's not going to make me write one word more for the Australian market because none of it goes to me. Ah, well, now hold on. There's a problem. Maybe it's just not being copied because under our... Well, it's on house, course packs, no, hold on. so it's so, being copied. So, well, just let me explain. Under the copyright agency model, we have sister collecting societies in countries all around the world uh, where survey data from the sample of institutions is taken and there are foreign rights owners in there. That money is repatriated through those collecting societies back to the owners of copyright in those works. Um, and I know it's millions of dollars for the US and millions of dollars for Canada though. Um, so. I know that rights owners there are being remunerated for use of their works. Sorry it hasn't happened for you yet, Corey. It's a slow <laughs> process. Because it's a survey, it's not a perfect science. It's a, it, it's a balancing act between burden and accuracy. Mm -hmm. And statisticians have told us it takes a cycle of something like 20 years for it to actually be truly representative. Well, I'm not sure how much we should adopt this system for everything else now. It's, it's, well, it's quite a long I mean, it's quite I, a long I get time. Two checks for, I get two checks a year for $45 from Access Canada for my work in course packs. Mm -hmm. And it does break it out. There's no, I, I know my work is used in foreign markets. I've never seen a foreign market appear on mm -hmm. any of my statements from Access. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I mean, it, it may be so. And, and again, like we can argue about whether an idea is good and then argue about whether it's well implemented. And as mm -hmm. I think we've already agreed that the idea of of, of doing actuarial modeling for some forms of compensation makes sense. But, you know, when we talk about the web, the likelihood that an author whose work is assigned on the web, you know, when I uh, teach grad students at the University of Southern California, I assign them to read Wikipedia articles and uh, to follow the edits to that to understand knowledge creation and how practitioners in different domains are uh, constructing knowledge and debating that knowledge. It's an excellent assignment. We go through it every week on a projector overhead. We make them uh, try to edit and, and, and fix the articles. And if they get reverted, they have to discuss why you can't cheat on this assignment. It's an awesome assignment to do. None of those Wikipedia authors will ever see any money because they're, they're not even identified by their real names. Well, and yet that's that. super the, important the Wikipedia model doesn't allow for it. It's right. offered so, on Creative Commons terms. Yeah, so, so Wikipedia having created, <laughs> well, no, you can, you can be a Creative Commons author inside a collecting society, I assure you. But, no, 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 uh, but I'm uh, saying Wikipedia is not a great example because well, the whole model is Creative Commons. Well, no, but my point is that the single most used reference work in the entire history of the world and likely for the foreseeable future history of the work is incompatible with this, with this model for the web, mm -hmm. which suggests that possibly this is not an adequate model, model for the web. The fact that it worked before uh, doesn't mean that it will work now because the pool of authors is by nature and through the nature of their creation pseudonymous, non-identifiable, not a member of a collecting society. And if the idea here is to ensure that they're fairly compensated, by definition, those authors cannot be compensated. And so if our, jo if our goal is to compensate them, we cannot compensate them through that model, period. Okay, yeah. now so I'm going so to jump we, in. So, no, I have so to so jump can in we, again. No, can I no, have to that, stop? I think that we really, comment can we, needs we come back to this answer. if there's time at the end, Zoe? Because mm -hmm. we do no, need to No, that actually on. really <laughs> does because, sorry, Sorry, Wikipedia may be one of the most used reference tools in, in some quarters. Cal actually runs surveys of what's copied in the educational uh, system in Australia and government. The material that is used that is under Creative Commons licensing, and that includes Wikipedia as well as a number of other things, is less than 2% of what is used in Australian educational settings. So it might be a terrible shame for the people that contribute to Wikipedia that they've signed on for terms that won't remunerate them. But in terms of writers uh, who are being used and recommended by academics in Australia, I don't know about North America, 
that is not a large part of the marketplace. Mm. I think I, I might actually have to jump in on this. I know I was like, I really have to change the conversation, but I do want to mention that there, there are some things that are remunerable in the way that the collecting society uh, license is set up that I think are really unsatisfactory and that you might be surprised to know that schools have to pay for with taxpayer money. So things that were treated as remunerable last year um, under the Cal license are things like, uh, telling students to print a web page from the RSPCA site about how to be an animal foster carer that had to be paid for, um, a teacher printing entry form so students could enter a computer challenge had to be paid for. So there, there are, I think, some problems in terms of determining what's remunerable and how that all gets out. But really now I'm going to move on to the next thing. Let's come back to that, quest, that, that, that really interesting issue about how can we shift that balance of power a little bit more towards authors. Now in Australia the way things are set up is we don't have any special protections for authors in copyright. We have what we call a laissez-faire approach to authors contracts which is French for do as you choose or depending on which translate site you use it could mean freedom to sign away all of your rights often for very little before anyone knows what they're worth. Um, elsewhere, particularly in continental Europe, they take a much more hands-on approach and recognise those inequalities of bargaining power that can often exist, um, and then enshrine authors' rights to a fair share via statutory protection. So there's lots of different kinds uh, of protections that exist. There are laws that allow authors to reclaim their rights after a certain amount of time or if a publisher fails to exploit them. Uh, there's protections that limit what can be taken from them in the first place. Um, and there's really interestingly, there's rights that guarantee fair or equitable or reasonable remuneration in some countries. So I'll throw this open to the panel. Uh, what do you think, the role for that kind of intervention, what would be useful, do you think, what would help Australian authors? Um, I, and I was doing my research by reading your blog posts, but I would love to Authors see... Authorsinterest.org. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Um, but I love the idea that in Europe, in a lot of countries in Europe, they have a clause that says if a book is, becomes a bestseller, unexpectedly successful, that the author is allowed to get an extra share of the remuneration. So that can be negotiated in Australia with rising royalties, sometimes there are bonus payments, and just the basis of royalties at all. You know, the author will get paid the more books are sold. But to have that in, enshrined in legislation would just be amazing in terms of bringing the power back to the author. Just a floor to put there for mm -hmm. that protection. Yep. Zoe, do you have any thoughts? Look, I know my German colleagues are, are very proud of their system and its protection of authors' rights. I think we need, we need to think hard. I'm the daughter of two writers, so of course I'm extremely uh, sympathetic to that idea. As Rebecca knows, we signed on to the US Free Trade Agreement uh, many years ago now, and that would not enable that under current Australian legislation mm. because uh, copyright has to be open to contract. Yeah, what let me I... unpack that. So that was a really sneaky little thing that came in as part of the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement. Uh, they stuck in a provision that was aimed at stopping us from protecting authors. So there's a provision that says all rights have to be freely transferred in, in contract. And so what that means is, you know, to me, I, I feel the hypocrisy of this because, you know, always in the copyright reform campaigns, you see authors absolutely at the front and center of the debate, right? But then behind the scenes, these actions are taken to make it as easy as possible to extract as much as possible um, and, and to prevent those, those protections from being enacted. But there are interesting ones. So certainly it's the Australia-US free trade agreement. The US has got an interesting author protective mechanism, you, you, doesn't you it? You can take your rights back after 35 years and this is this is something our music colleagues have done great work with uh, historically there have been very poor contracts signed by musicians especially at the starts of their career and when iTunes came along and the digital music market came along a bunch of them went back to their record labels and said I'd like to reopen those negotiations uh, for the terms that I'm on, otherwise I'm going to take my digital rights back and start selling them directly to iTunes. And since there's no longer a physical market, that means I'm taking all my rights back. And a few record labels called their bluffs, and then after a few well-known acts started doing it, they decided that it would be much better to, to renegotiate with authors. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. those those um, sort of time-based limitations on what authors can give away, which I'm assuming we can have in Australia because they do have them in the US, regardless of what the, the FDA says. 
They're, they're really interesting if we think about our rationales for granting copyright in the first place. So there's a couple of these, and it's, it's worth taking a moment to just unpack them to think about what we're talking about here. It's, what, what we're interested in doing when we award a copyright is, first of all, we want to incentivize the thing to be created. So we want to incentivize the initial creation and we want to incentivize that ongoing investment in continuing to make it available. Now that's purely an economic aim and so the economists can tell us what we need to grant in order to achieve that. And they can tell us, they, they punch it into their models and there's pretty much universal agreement that 25 years of exclusive, exclusivity is enough to incentivize even the most lavish investments. But we shouldn't stop there, and that's what I told the Productivity Commission uh, when they did have uh, a note about, well, 25 years is all you need to incentivize production. They did the full stop, but there's no full stop because on top of that, there's another really crucial and important element, which is that we're also motivated to recognize and reward authors for those creative contributions uh, that, that give us these, these works that inspire us and take us to different worlds and make us better. And so it's that rewards component that justifies copyright that lasts longer than 25 years. Now, we, we have to award copyright for life plus 70 years under the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement or life plus 50 years under the Berne Convention. And these, that life plus 50 at least is, is an unmovable flaw. But beyond that 25 years, that's justifiable as rewards for authors. And that's interesting because when we think about the incentives bit, we don't really mind who that goes to. What we're interested in here is getting the works produced and available. But when we think about that rewards bit, well, we do care who that goes to and we want that that's justifiable only for authors. And so reversion after 25 years, for example, um, taking the works back to authors at that point, at which point they could re-exploit um, if they want to re-license it to their publisher, um, or maybe they want to license it to a digital public library uh, in exchange for per loan remuneration, all of those kinds could, could be opened up. I think that there's loads of potential interventions. You know, after the Enron scandal, the United States created this uh, regulatory regime called Sarbanes-Oxley that made C-suite executives personally criminally liable for um, deliberate misstatements on financial statements. And that ended in, with the stroke of a pen, the practice of off the books third shift, pre third shift pressings of CDs that were pressed but never remunerated to the uh, musical artists because mm. literally the CEO would go to jail if they kept doing it. That, that's, that's a pretty straightforward thing that I think few of us would really disagree with, that, that um, deliberate use of misleading financial statements should be a criminal matter that named individuals are held liable for. Mm. Uh, in the US Free Trade Agreement, uh, Australia uh, uh, unwisely acceded to its own version of the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act, Section 1201, which prohibits removing a digital lock even if the rights holder authorizes it. And what that means is that when Amazon puts DRM on a Kindle book, neither the publisher nor the author can authorize the reader to move that off a Kindle and onto a rival platform. That means that every dollar that Amazon generates from your copyright is a dollar in switching costs your customer has to incur to follow you to a platform where they'll give you more money than Amazon. The more that goes on, the worse your deal will get from Amazon because the less they have to to worry about you walking away. Yeah, speaking about that though, and Corey, uh, Corey um, had a terrific idea I first heard him talk about in 2013 in San Francisco called Shut Up and Take My Money, which has now been launched. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I, you know, as an Anglosphere author, I have a US publisher, I have a Commonwealth publisher. Uh, oftentimes when a reader tries to buy my books online, they're told, I'm sorry, your credit card is localized to the wrong territory, so we won't sell you a book. Uh, particularly outside of the English markets in the open territories, Sweden and Germany, places where everyone speaks better English than I do, uh, if you try to buy the books, often as not, they'll just say no. Um, and so I created a platform where I'm the retailer of my ebooks. It's called Shut Up and Take My Money. Uh, and when you go to craphound.com, which is my website, uh, slash shop, you can buy all of my ebooks. I'm the retailer for all of my publishers. So I work out which publisher gets the money. You just pay me. Uh, you don't have to know what my commercial arrangements are to read my books. That's never been a thing a reader ever had to know to read a book. I remunerate, remunerate the publisher, but I t keep Amazon.
Amazon's VIG. I keep the 30% that Amazon would otherwise get. Then my publisher takes 25% of the 70% I remit to them and sends it back to me. And with the publishers that are more liberal, I've also instituted a pay what you like, uh, which I'd historically done with a lot of my books. Uh, but as Amazon and others tightened up, it got harder and harder to do. The reality is that the 80% or 20% of people who buy 80% of the ebooks know perfectly well how to get any ebook they want for free in as many or as few clicks as buying it from Amazon. And so they're all making a voluntary payment already. And one of the things I've found is that while there are some people who choose not to pay, there are other people who come back and pay over the odds. They pay more than the retail asking price having read the book. So it's become a, a pretty virtuous cycle for me. And it allows me to make an offer to my readers that no one else can make, which is that this is the way to buy my books that increases the share that the author gets. And I do it in a way that remunerates my publishers for the marketing that they put in and the editorial work they put in that makes sure my agent's in the loop for the work they do to, to close those deals. And it's working all the way around. And this is the last leg of what's been a year on tour. And when I get back, we're open sourcing the software so that any author, author can run it or author societies can run it for their authors. And it's a way to realize what a lot of authors groups have asked for, which is double the ebook royalties, which, you know, the publishers are going to drink a warm gallon of spit for breakfast every morning before they double your ebook. <laughs> royalties, but it lets you do it, right? It, it gets you double the ebook royalties uh, without having to change the deal with the publisher one whit. Yeah, and that's what I'm always hearing. Yeah. That is what I'm always hearing. I'm, I'm hearing writers' organizations, they complain, what, what's Amazon doing for that 30%? But it's, it's really unfortunate, actually, that with those, those decisions that you were talking about just before to lock in DRM, you know, the decision, it was the publishers who, I think, thought they were having Amazon when they insisted on DRM on audiobooks and e-books. But the problem is, you know, we now have the technology where we can create a co-op where authors run it themselves because payments are so cheap. Right? But the thing that stops it being convenient for consumers and working for consumers is that all of their books are locked into Amazon software. Uh, and unless you bypass those digital locks, you can't get them out and so then have these books that you purchase directly from authors in the same convenient location. So ironically, while that was supposed to uh, help the publishing industry, it's, it's inadvertently locked in this, this enormous uh, market power that Amazon has got. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I see uh, it's, it's time now for questions. Uh, so as I said, we'd really like to start with a woman or a person who identifies as non-binary. Uh, any questions? We've got roving mics around the, the room. We have one here at the front. Thank you for your um, summary of the explanation of the sort of close to cartel uh, monopolistic culture within the publishing industry. Um, is it, and, and considering um, Corey's fantastic, um, I don't quite understand the mechanics of it, but fantastic explanation of an alternative business model. The question is, is it any wonder that writers have flocked to the Amazon model, uh, which in sim the simplest terms returns 70% of the revenue to them, uh, allows them to name the price of their book, uh, leaves all other responsibilities in their lap, uh, but also leaves the ownership rights with them. Can you respond? Or yeah. do you so this is, this is really uh, hashtag not all authors as well, because yeah. there are some authors doing really well in the current environment. Um, Alex, could you talk about that? Yeah, oh. um, so I do a lot of, uh, I'm, um, as an agent, I, I work a lot with the genre communities. So science fiction, fantasy, romance, crime. And romance in particular is doing very well with self-publishing, um, as is science fiction, but really romance is just powering ahead. And it's lovely spending time with the romance authors because they're the one bit of the industry that isn't depressed. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing so well and yeah. they make the, it work for them. Yeah. At the same time, for every, even in romance where ebooks are doing great and self-publishing is doing great, you're still getting one out of 100 who is making a success. Mm. And you've still got 99 authors who are selling four copies to their friends. Um, so self-publishing is great and I love that it's there, but it's hard work. It is not an easy solution because publishers from the micro publishers up to the, the Penguin Random Houses, they're, they're doing, running a business. They're, they're doing amazing marketing, publicity, exactly. editing, mm -hmm. cover design. They have relationships with the booksellers. And while self-publishing is fantastic, you, if you set up that way, you have to do all of that yourself. And that's why a lot of people I talk to will give self-publishing a go and then try to get back into traditional publishing. 
And sometimes, sorry, I'll jump in and say if they've been successful in self-publishing and they think they want the legitimacy of traditional publishing, they get very frustrated with how slow traditional publishing works and go back. But then <laughs> traditional authors who get jealous of the green fields of self-publishing give it a go, find it's way too hard and complicated and end up going back. And then you get the few ones that are in the middle that are hybrid. I think what Alex is saying there is really right, that the value that publishers do bring, um, if, if they're good publishers, which is editing, which is wonderful. And all the many wonderful writers I've met have said their best partners in their works are their editors who give them really good critical feedback and make their works a better work than it might have been. But I actually think the thing that is most difficult for many authors to do not all, Corey's obviously very good at it, but it is getting yourself a profile, uh, particularly in an online globalised environment. And that is something that the marketing teams of publishing houses should do well. Um, and I think that is really hard for a lot of authors to understand how hard it is with so much competition. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the hard problem of politics, religion, marketing, uh, uh, publishing, is how do you get anyone anywhere to care about what you have to say, right? Mm -hmm. If there was a reliable, systematic way of, of getting people to care about the thing you think is important, we would live in a very different world in every domain. And so, you know, when people talk to me about self-publishing, which I've done some of as well, I always say, you need to have a theory about why someone will care that your book exists. You have to have a way to test that theory with a, with a retail strategy. You have, a way to ev you have to have a way to evaluate the results of that test, and you have to have a way to iteratively improve that theory based on the new evidence that you get. And if you don't have all of those, you may get very, very lucky, but it's like, it's, it's like you know, chucking a dart with your eyes closed, not facing the dartboard in a different room before they've hung the dartboard up. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's, it is, it is, um, it is a terrible pity to have poured your heart and soul into a book and decided to self-publish it without having done that element of it because the great odds are that no one is gonna care that the book exists and you just sort of need to ask yourself how many books have you bought this month from people who self-published and, and what did they do to get your attention? How did you find yourself uh, you know, falling over their transoms? Um, and uh, you know, I think that the thing that publishers do is they, they make a work public, right? It's not that they format text files, it's not that they edit them, it's not that they market them, it's that they find, they take any and all necessary steps, which may be very few or maybe very many, to connect a work and an audience. And unless you know what those steps can be, are, or unless you have an idea of, of how, to, how to figure that out, then you probably shouldn't be considering self-publishing or you should be working that out before you consider self-publishing. Hmm. Do we have another question for the roving mics? Someone down here, I think. Someone down here. We can't see anyone, including the mics. If you're a mic person and you're headed Hello, towards Hello, I have a mic. All right, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, that was fascinating. I'm just wondering whether you think there is any role for unionisation in helping to improve the conditions of authors. Absolutely. That's why the Australian Society of Authors exists, and it has fought for a long time for authors' rights in Australia. Was it founded in 1960? In the 1960s. Uh, but absolutely for sure. And it's not just in arguments with publishers. I don't think the publishers are always the, the enemy at all. It is in arguments with government over regulation that will actually support creators in, in creating new things, support authors in other ways through, whether it's through grants, whether it's through profiling Australian works on a world market um, with support of, of stands at international fairs that promote Australian books. But what about taking it further? What about Screen Actors Guild or, or Screen Writers Guild? A writers Guild type we've got unionization. A writer, we've got a Writers Guild. But yeah. the Australian Society of Authors is an authors union. It does stand up for the, the very basic rights of authors. But, but what about, you know, so one of the, one of the terrific rates. things that the, the Writers Guild does, I mean, it recognises um, those fascinating dynamics of creative labour markets where 
where creative workers can be, like they're so willing to give their labor for less than they ought to, that they have to enter into a collective agreement to punish each other for doing that if they work below a certain minimum, right? And so, and that's why you have the union minimums, you know, in Hollywood and so on. Is there, the is ASA set minimum rates, and they're not they, but they are, they, well, they're not enforceable, but nor are actually the, the screenwriters right oh, here. But, I assure you the screenwriter, I live in Hollywood, I assure you, you know, the screenwriters right turn for us. Um, but we do, that, that is a role for the Australian Society of Authors. It is akin to a, a union for writers. Um, and we definitely need it there. And, and people should join it. What I'd really like to see is perhaps, you know, of course there are, as Corey said, people at the top of the writing pyramid who have a lot of bargaining power. You know, whether there's a role for, for those luminaries to sort of band together and say we only publish if these minimum terms are... are I mean, that's what, the, what, that's what the Screenwriters Guild does. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, we moved to Hollywood from London two years ago to, to Burbank, which is, you know, where all the studios, where all the writers are. You can't chuck a, a, a coffee cup at a coffee shop without hitting someone who's writing a screenplay. And during the writer strike, stuff didn't get written. Mm -hmm. And, you know, writers who were on six-figure, seven-figure writing deals down tools until the writers at the very bottom of the pyramid were given a decent shake. Mm -hmm. And they did it through solidarity. It's an incredibly powerful model. It's one that um, we're seeing uh, employed in very exciting ways in other sectors that have an oversupply of labor. Uh, the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, which represents and organizes fast food workers and other low-waged workers who are in semi-skilled and unskilled domains, which ironically shares a lot of commonality with the, uh, with the creative arts market in that there's a lot more people who want the jobs than, than there are jobs for them. And so the wages, given market conditions, fall to very low, to sub, sub uh, subsistence mm -hmm. wages. They have not only shown that they can organize effectively, but that they can organize in a way that is responsive to the members in uh, that uh, it goes beyond anything any trade union has done before. I'm the child of union organizers, and you know the unions have been prone to the same sins of hierarchy that every hierarchy has been prone to, and SEIU has shown how you can have these very responsive, transparent institutions uh, that leverage the power of networks to make the books public, to make the deliberations public, and to make the uh, membership, to give them a, a voice in the daily operation of their union. It's, and it's, it's, it has created the solidarity, right? It's, it's, it's created that situation where people will go out on strike to support not themselves, but someone in another part of the city or in another city altogether, because they all stand together or they all hang separately. Mm. I wonder if the model is harder for authors of trade publications, fiction, poetry, whatever, because they are most often not in the position of employee, employer, uh, and you don't have the same regulation, the same, you know, I work five days a week, and it, whether it's harder to collectivise that in that way. Well, the screenwriters are all contractors and the fast food workers are all zero hours contract at will employees. So, you know, it's not a directly analogous, right? Because I'm not a contractor to my publisher. I'm a I mean, supplier I like the idea, the, but I'm just yeah. wondering if it's harder but, to... But, and so it would, have, it would have unique challenges, but at least the one thing that we can see from SEIU and from the screenwriters is that it's not dispositive, right? You don't have to be in a traditional waged employee situation to organize a trade union that's really effective. It may be that, that, that the relationship that I have with my publisher as a supplier is different enough that that just might be the point beyond which the organization is possible. But at least we know that it, it, it's not a deal breaker to not be a traditional employee because you know, most mm, successful yeah. unions in the world you know, are new unions. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question for our raving mics. Have we answered everything? Have we broken you? Somebody up the back has a piece of paper, they're waving. Oh. All right. I was going to say, it was also non-controversial. I don't know what anyone would have to disagree with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a happy sound. Um, so by what you sort of said, the Australian Writers Guild is sort of like a one-stop shop where people can go to begin with to like find out what to do, is it? Or the Victorian Writers Centre upstairs, is that what you could do? I, I'm, I say that the Australian Society of Authors, that's the organisation I know best, mm. that it will provide legal advice to its members 
uh, including reviews of contracts, looking at standard terms, saying this doesn't look very fair, think about this, you know, long term, this could be a concern. And for um, me, one of the issues that a lot of authors, particularly first time authors, didn't understand was the role of CAL, the Collecting Society, and that actually for a number of works, that could be a, a much more valuable right than the upfront advance, and that it was worth being concerned about and negotiating. Uh, and the ASA is in a position to argue that uh, for authors and to know because it looks at so many contracts. So it's well aware of what's happening right across the industry. And I might mention as well that lending rights in Australia are an incredibly valuable source of income for Australia's authors. Uh, in the, the Throsby study about authors' income, so the Cal revenue is averaging $400 and the, the, the public lending right $1,100 for Australian authors. And this is a really interesting one because it actually sits outside of copyright law. It's a statutory entitlement that's to compensate authors for the uses of their books in public libraries and educational libraries. And the allocations are set in the statute so that three quarters of it goes to the author and one quarter goes to the publisher and that cannot be extracted by copyright. So that's another really interesting and valuable part it of the mix. Yes, and can I say in Australia that is a right that the Australian Society of Authors fought for and continues to fight for. Round of for. applause for the Australian yeah. Society of Authors. <laughs> All right, well, we have to wrap it up there. That's been uh, such an interesting mix. We love our Australian publishers. We're a little bit concerned about late capitalism. Please join me in uh, warmly thanking Corey and the Zoe and Alex. <laughs> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. 